Jewel in the Crown is a very good way of, of conveying how important the, the San Pedro Valley has been to this organization and uh, I think to the region and I think today we'll try to convey how important it was in the past as well. So uh, Jeff and I are obviously both uh, with Archaeology Southwest. Jeff is a preservation archaeologist. He got his degree here at the University of Arizona. Started looking at issues related to uh, migra migration fairly intensively in his dissertation work. And I, too, way before Jeff, uh, graduated from University of Arizona. <laughs> and uh, what I will be trying to do is to share with you some of the uh, background on the archaeological survey we did out there and also what I especially want to convey is how important that place is as an intact landscape. So I've got a lot of pretty pictures. Um, <coughs> so the San Pedro Valley, uh, we work at Archaeology Southwest all across the uh, American Southwest and we cover the Mexican Northwest in our uh, publication, the Archaeology Southwest magazine. And you see the, the entire watershed there in southeastern Arizona and down into Sonora uh, spans the borderland. And it's about 150 mile long uh, river and it flows from south to north. So you may see us catching ourselves uh, up and down and, and uh, those kinds of things with a river that flows north is sometimes confusing. But uh, the area that we worked on in terms of our project is really just about half of, of the river from Benson north to Winkleman. So that's sort of highlighted in, in green on the map to the right there. And in 1990, we started up our volunteer survey. We, we as an organization had done other surveys prior to that. We had worked in uh, the Southern Tucson Basin, we'd worked up at Catalina State Park, out in Gunsight Mountain, uh, southwest of, of town, and over at the base of Kitt Peak in the uh, Coyote, Coyote Mountain area. And after finishing those surveys, we were looking for a new opportunity. And the San Pedro Valley was a, an extensive uh, landscape, and it allowed us to uh, find a place that was accessible less or uh, roughly an hour's worth of drive time out there so you didn't spend all of your time uh, in the car and yet it was a place that was outside of the uh, current development uh, processes that were happening around the Tucson Basin which were kind of the motivation from for a lot of our early work uh, in these other places closer to Tucson. So from Benson north to Winkleman there's about not quite 450 little green specks on that uh, map there on the right. We covered accessible land uh, along either side of the, the floodplain of the Santa Cruz, of the San Pedro, and literally the volunteers provided most of the funding for that work. We had a little bit of, of uh, provision of a vehicle and, and some uh, release time for someone from Ar uh, Desert Archaeology, Inc. And the rest, volunteers provided uh, vehicles to drive out there. Sometimes we had as many as 25 people going out on a Saturday um, to uh, do the survey work out in the valley. Very, very productive. And again, it was a very pleasant landscape within which to work. It was. It's a beautiful uh, environment, getting the opportunity to see it go through the seasons. We started in the fall uh, and went through, uh, usually about April is when we, we halted. One to uh, two times per month, we would go out on these, these uh, weekend uh, survey. And this is just walking over the land surface, seeing what we can see on the surface. And that's where these uh, almost 450 sites were, were recorded. And what I'm gonna, highlight here is a little bit about the ball courts. The <coughs> Hohokam uh, ball courts roughly uh, begin maybe as early as 750 or so AD and on the San Pedro we think maybe this 1100, 800 to 1100 time range is, is the, 
the key time frame. Uh, a Hoakam village was organized around an open plaza, uh, a bunch of pit houses, a uh, residential area around that, so semi-subterranean uh, pit structures. And off that plaza in every large village was a uh, ball court. And out there on that landscape, <coughs> we've documented large villages that uh, in most cases we have found the ball courts and other large villages we assume that they're there. So this is the distribution. There's a northern cluster up near Aravaipa and the Gila River and a southern cluster from Reddington south, uh, not quite all the way to Benson. And the one new ball court discovery on this survey was by one of our volunteers, where is Sherry Freeman? <laughs> Um, and so up there in a high location overlooking the, the valley, in a, actually a very surprising location for a ball court, uh, Sherry uh, insisted that, yes, this needs to be looked at more closely. And indeed, it, she had uh, located a ball court. So that is why that is the Freeman site in honor of Sherry Freeman. It's I won't, because we're not focusing on this time period, I'm not going to go into uh, a lot more other than so show you some of the landscapes out there uh, where ball courts are preserved. I've actually got several images of the same ball court, but uh, along the river there, uh, south of Reddington, the court is there. We'll see that a little closer up, but again, I want you to get the feel for that environment out there and, and how. Uh, what a remarkable place. So Henry Wallace took most of these aerial photographs that we'll, I'll be highlighting here. A uh, slightly different view across uh, the San Pedro, um, looking at that same court. Again, the dirt road uh, is, is a, been a key factor in preserving the archeology span along that, uh, this stretch of the river. Uh, if there were, we'll talk about roads later. Um, another view of that same place closer up you can see the big berms of the ball court there on either side. That, we were out there yesterday and I paced that. It's 75 yards long, so almost the length of a, of a uh, football field and uh, a remarkable, and around it is a, is a village as well, but the ball court really stands out from the, the air like that. And then at Reddington, the uh, historic schoolhouse is in the foreground there and in the background the uh, ball court of a very large uh, community that was focused on to Redfield Canyon. And that's actually the ball court that we now own uh, eight acres of, of that uh, site that includes that, that ball court. And backing off to the uh, larger view there at, at Reddington, again, that's the same court that we were just looking at. And uh, you see it on the landscape, the schoolhouse in the foreground. And I'm gonna, pass the uh, talk off here to Jeff Clark, who will uh, pick up the sort of the research story. And then I'm gonna come back at the end and this will be my final um, slide as well that we'll get back to this uh, a little later. So Jeff, uh, if you wanna come up and I'll uh, deal with the change of PowerPoints here. Well, we've been uh, working along the San Pedro now for 20 years, and uh, now we have our volume out, so. <laughs> um, I thought I would just uh, go through uh, some of the important archeological finds that we've made uh, during this interval, and, uh, and some of this will be a review to uh, some of you, and some of it will be uh, uh, new. Um, but um, I like to start out with this slide. It's a really old slide of kind of southwest culture areas. And it shows that the San Pedro Valley is sort of in the Hohokam culture area, which is where the, you know, the people of the Sonoran Desert, they were big irrigation farmers. And um, um, their core area is where Phoenix is today. So just like kind of our current situation, a lot of the influence unfortunately comes from Phoenix. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so was the whole calm world. Um, and the San Pedro is kind of considered uh, on the periphery 
uh, or the San Pedro Valley is on the periphery of this world. It's also occupied by local groups. And as we'll see through time, there's also a migration both from that Pueblo Mogollon area and from the uh, Pueblo Anasazi area. And that's extremely important, the, the, those population movements coming down south and impacting uh, both local groups and, uh, you know, uh, uh, that are influenced by the Hohokam and actually Hohokam groups that are living in the San Pedro will be an important, important theme. Uh, Bill showed this slide, but yes, that green area is our, uh, our study area. Uh, it goes from Winkleman, where the San Pedro hits the uh, Gila River, down south to uh, Benson, which is about where I-10 crosses um, um, uh, the San Pedro River. And what's nice about this study area is that it's kind of an insular area. It's surrounded by mountains. It's a good study unit. Um, it, it's well bounded so that if you went, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't want to increase the, if you increase the size, uh, you might pick up, you wouldn't pick up anything more. This is, this is a bounded area that uh, we, we studied. Um, and that's, um, 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 no, it, it's, it's rather unique. The other unique thing about it is that being, it's just to the east of the Tucson Basin, but yet it's a relatively uh, unfractured, I would, it's not a pristine landscape, but it certainly is very well preserved. There's some um, mining towns, some ranching, farming, but generally just about every archeological site that has been uh, um, deposited there from the Paleo-Indian times, 12,000 BC, all the way to um, the end of the prehistoric sequence and in the historic sequence, traces of that ha those sites have been preserved. And that's very unique for a river valley in the southwest. I mean, you don't have that in Phoenix. You don't have that in Tucson. There's just incredible preservation there. There's one gap area that I'll bring up at the end where we don't have sites, which is interesting and, and what that means. But it is very much a, a, a very intact landscape out there. And Bill's slides uh, shows some of that. Um, before we arrived on the scene, um, that, the slide to the left are sort of early excavations along the San Pedro. And um, I'll use my little pointer here. Um, the first person to excavate along the San Pedro was a, a, a guy named William Duffin in the 1930s. He was a Byron Cummings student uh, at the University of Arizona, and he excavated at the Bayless Ranch in Reddington Ruin. And he just passed away recently, fairly recently. He lived to a ripe old age. Um, and did some excavations there. Next on the scene, and probably most importantly, was the Ameren Foundation, who excavated sites um, um, in the southern portion of the, of the lower valley, uh, especially Davis and Reeve ruin. And I'll be talking a lot about Davis and Reeve later on, because these are two of the uh, immigrant enclaves that uh, uh, have gotten a lot of publicity. Um, then came the uh, Arizona Highway Salvage program. They were actually going to pave the road between, um, 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 on the southern half of the San Pedro between Benson and, um, and um, San Manuel, and they did the archaeology for it. Uh, but fortunately, they never paved the road, so we got to do the archaeology, and they didn't pave the road, so um, it's still an unpaved road, and that's helped uh, protect the San Pedro uh, greatly. And finally, uh, Central Arizona College uh, excavated some sites. Uh, they did the only upland area excavation at Twin Hawks, and then right around the Aravipa confluence of Big Ditch and Ash Terrace. And actually, uh, uh, Linda Pierce's husband, Mike Bartlett, I don't know if he's here. Uh, nope, he was the last director of those excavations at uh, for Central Arizona College. So um, all these, most of these excavations were very intensive. They excavated most of the site. And so we have this narrow window of uh, on, on a few of the sites out there that have been really intensively excavated. Um, when we came along, and um, this is, these are the sites that we tested uh, to the right there, um, we basically um, um, managed to uh, um, put test excavations in every major classic period site um, along the San Pedro, and there's 29 sites there. And by classic period, I mean sites that date to about 1200 AD to 1450 AD, so late in the, in the pre-contact sequence. Um, so even though we were just doing testing, um, um, we really complemented the work of these uh, very intensive excavations. We actually went back to uh, some of these sites, like Reeve and Davis Ruin, 
that had been excavated earlier to excavate them with modern methods. The, the Duffin was in the 30s, the Ameren's ex excavations was in the 1950s, so they weren't screening, they weren't doing modern kind of uh, techniques. Um, so we went back to those sites and, 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 ex and tested them with modern techniques. And um, though we weren't thinking we were doing anything special at the time, it turns out that there's not many areas where you have this kind of bounded area where um, all the sites are preserved from a particular time period and actually going back in time. And the same institution basically did the same kind of techniques and tested all of those sites. Um, um, there's just not too many areas of this size like that, and that makes it kind of unique. Um, uh, similar to the um, um, survey, um, it was all volunteers um, supervised by archaeologists. And uh, in terms of the testing, uh, what we did was put little holes, lots of little holes in these sites, testing basically all of the trash deposits and trash bins that we could find. And this was a, turned out to be a really good strategy and became sort of the basis of uh, what we're calling preservation archaeology now, um, in that uh, these trash mounds are easy for volunteers to excavate. Um, they're just people dumping their trash in piles. And um, um, you don't do a lot of damage to the architecture, but you get a lot of bang for your buck in terms of the artifacts. You get a lot of sherds, a lot of flake stone, a lot of animal bone, a lot of uh, plant remains. So we basically just tried to excavate all the uh, trash mounds around these sites and as much as possible avoid architecture. And uh, we ended up digging 106 units. Um, and as I said previously, it's, it's definitely powered by volunteers. Uh, Ken fights here. He's the he was one of he was one of our big earth movers out there. Uh, when I mean powered by volunteers, Ken was one of the major uh, uh, power brokers there. And he's actually throwing some dirt at Sherry Freeman, and they're sitting next to each other back there. Um, and uh, no, um, and I think uh, Patty Cook, one of our supervisors, is back back to us. But we had over 150 volunteers, not at one time out there. We was about a group of 15 or 20 at a time, but uh, about 150 volunteers cycled through the project. And they were from all walks of life. There were uh, people from Tucson, of course, lots of people from Tucson, retirees, professionals, um, long-term Tucson residents, people from Phoenix, a lot of local people from the San Pedro. Uh, we really had a, a strong community of volunteers out there uh, while we were working. And we really, really needed them and appreciated them because they did the lion's share of the work. Um, we had avocation lists working along profes with professionals. That's uh, a Bob Conforti there, and he's standing next to uh, Lex Lindsay. And I think they're on top of uh, Reeve Ruin um, uh, there, one of the immigrant, immigrant enclaves. Um, we had great supervisors. We had over about 35 supervisors. Uh, to the left, uh, if you recognize uh, Jim Vint over there looking very um, uh, serious and studious. And um, my lovely wife, Sarah Her, uh, is looking surprised and somewhat angry that I'm taking a picture of her. <laughs> but um, um, no, we had just about everybody from Desert Archaeology come out, the, the, the contract company. Um, we had people, uh, Doug Craig, uh, um, Kathy Henderson, a lot of Hohokam archaeologists come out and, and volunteer and supervise. And, uh, and that was, you know, that was necessary with the, with the volunteer effort. Um, we also had a student internship program, uh, mainly with U of A and, and Pima, and 17 student interns cycled through the pro, uh, project, um, and uh, a lot of them went on to become, or are becoming famous archaeologists, and two of them returned. Um, uh, to the left, uh, Mary Ownby is now, uh, she went off and got her PhD, I think, at Cambridge, and now she's the head of the photography part department at the uh, Desert Archaeology, Inc., and Anna Neusel, uh, uh to, the, um, to the left there, is uh, standing with Betty Lee. She became a preservation archaeology, uh, archaeologist for us and worked extensively in the Safford Basin, doing much what we were doing in the San Pedro in the, in the Safford area. And she's sits, um, standing there with Betty Lee, who was one of the, uh, they got to overlap. Uh, she was one of the uh, famous archaeologists from the Safford area. Um, 
had to get a picture of Don Burgess in there too. It looks like he's supervising there. Um, um, and, um, but in terms of um, uh, um, land ownership was a major challenge out there. We had 17 different landowners that we had to get permission from uh, for these 29 sites. We were denied permission to just one site and that was because some sort of internal family feud. But uh, Patrick Lyons and Bill Dooley, they did a remarkable job. Um, we, we were dealing with BLM, um, uh, state land, uh, city land. Um, we were dealing with two copper companies out there that we got permission, uh, ranchers. Uh, we were in, literally in the backyards of residences digging sites. So um, um, it, was, it was quite an effort um, to get permission uh, um, in, in, at sites in this area. So let's move on to the archaeology. Um, I'm going to mainly focus on the classic period, which is the late end of things, after ball courts um, come and go. But uh, just to overlap with Bill, this is the Reddington ball court to the, uh, to the left there that we now own. And um, around that would have been large, a large pit house community. You, do, you can't see that community because all those pit houses are, are, are buried. But uh, the Reddington ball court is, is a huge ball court. It's about it's almost the size of a football field, I think, as well. And um, um, these large pre-classic, the pre-classic is an interval from about 700 AD to about 1200 AD. Um, but uh, starting at about 700, 750, they start building these ball courts and building big pit house villages around them. And these are the centers of irrigation communities. In Phoenix, you've got really big irrigation communities. Here, you've got much smaller ones. They're just you know maybe a few miles along the, the canals. And this, this slide to the, um, uh, the, the diorama ceramic figurine there is uh, actually from West Mexico, but it shows the ball game being played. And this was definitely a Mesoamerican concept that came up to somebody in Phoenix or uh, where there are a lot of ball courts, went down there and saw what was going on and decided it was a good idea to uh, build them in Phoenix. And from Phoenix, they moved out to probably the San Pedro. But you can see that people are on the berms, uh, spectators kind of, serving a bleacher function, and then there's a, a very big uh, ball being uh, kicked around there. And we think this, the function of these ball courts were in southern Arizona were similar. Uh, just some other pre-classic uh, uh, Hohokam traits. To con I would like to contrast with the later period where we have uh, migration. Uh, in terms of pottery, the Hohokam are known for red on buff pottery. Um, they make it with a special technique, uh, paddle and anvil technique, where they uh, you know, build up slabs of pottery uh, or clay with a, a, a paddle and work it with an anvil. Um, this is uh, in contrast to Pueblo groups that do kind of a coil and scrape technique. They build up snakes of, 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 of clay and then smooth them over. Um, also, uh, cre uh, cremation burials, uh, formal cremation burials are associated with the Hohokam, while the Pueblo groups tend to uh, bury their dead um, without cremating. Um, this is sort of a picture of that. This is a picture of the uh, pre-classic settlement in the San Pedro divided up into two time periods, um, an early time period, 750 to 950. Uh, during this time period, um, um, everybody's pretty much living in ball court villages. Um, so the, the settlement size is, is generally pretty big, maybe 100 to 150 people. Um, I just want to point out this area here to the north. Um, this is this Arrow Viper Creek area is the best place to do farming in the San Pedro uh, Valley. It's uh, this, the Arrow Viper recharges the San Pedro. There's lots of uh, areas to, for fields, and there's generally uh, uh, permanent water there. So um, that's an area where the Hohokam really settle down um, and, and concentrate on um, throughout the sequence uh, going into the Classic period. Um, they make buff wares there. That's the only place in the San Pedro that they make those red on buff pottery. They're importing it from the Phoenix area and they're making uh, a, a local imitation in the uh, Air Vipa area. As you go south, the whole com influence diminishes, but you have ball courts all the way down to um, Trace Alamos near Benson. So the ball court idea is going all the way down to um, uh, almost to the end of our project area. But uh, you start picking up more and more local kind of influences um, um, as, you, as you head south. As you go through time, um, 
these ball court villages kind of break apart. Um, and uh, by 1100, their uh, ball courts pretty much are out of, fall out of use. Um, but we see people dispersing across the landscape into these farmstead and hamlets, you know, maybe 15, 20, 30 people per settlement. Um, and uh, that's the settlement pattern that uh, is going on in the San Pedro when we hit the uh, classic period. So um, going to the classic period, um, we can divide the classic period kind of into two periods, uh, two, two phases. Uh, the early classic, which is about 1150 to about 1275, 1300, and the late classic, which is about 1300 to 1450. In terms of the early classic, not a whole lot is going on in the San Pedro. Uh, people remain uh, dispersed in these um, farmsteads and hamlets. One thing that is going on is they, they make a transition from pit houses, living in pit houses, to uh, surface uh, masonry and adobe architecture. Another thing that uh, is going on in the early classic period, we see a lot of corrugated pottery start appearing in the San Pedro, which is really weird because corrugated, corrugated pottery is generally a Puebloan type of pottery. It's made, it's a, a textured kind of ware. Um, it's made with a coil and scrape method. Um, so very, very Puebloan in character. And uh, whenever you do a pattern, when you, whenever you kind of work with the San Pedro and look at archeological patterns, the San Pedro always works. There's, there's, there, there's places where you, the archeology span is very complicated and patterns are very complicated. Whenever you take an artifact in this San Pedro area, it always, you always get a nice patterning, and this is showing this pattern here is showing the corrugated pottery distribution density in the San Pedro, and it follows. And these, this is based on our test units at these sites, and it just follows a beautiful contour pattern. And you kind of get the feeling you're at the tail end of a of a distribution here, and um, um, that's centered here. And then actually, there's some sites with corrugated pottery in the northeast Tucson basin. And then corrugated pottery just kind of stops. So you can almost see a, a, a kind of a connection here. Um, and then um, this pattern, uh, um, one of our uh, interns followed up on, and she wanted to take a look at oops, pretty much the whole Southwest and see how this pattern fits with that. And um, if you look at the this, this same kind of corrugated density pattern, you can see that uh, um, in the Mogollon Highland area here, or in the transitions, I mean, you get the most corrugated pottery, and you can sort of see this kind of corrugated finger that's dipping into the, uh, the Safford area, and then that's where it was cutting through the San Pedro, and it just kind of stops in northeast Tucson Basin. And all this pottery we know from the sands um, um, in it is, is being locally made. This isn't tr being traded. You wouldn't trade a pot that was um, uh, it was an ugly pot I was showing on the previous slide. So you can rule out trade here. Um, you, you, may, you, you may not be able to rule out that people are copying each other, but our best explanation is that there are actually uh, migrants coming down from the highlands and moving through Safford and then through that central San Pedro area over to Reddington Pass into the northeast Tucson Basin. And um, they don't seem to have a lot of impact. They kind of, the corrugated pottery goes away after a uh, a few uh, decades, and uh, the settlement pattern doesn't change. But um, they're the precursor of a much more long distance migration uh, coming from Northeast Arizona um, that we, uh, a lot of our research is focused on, and, and the San Pedro was really the first area that we um, uh, really studied this migration. And it's coming all the way from this Cayenta Tucson region in uh, northeast Arizona, particularly the Cayenta region, which is basically where Monument Valley is. It's Keats Seal and Batotican are two very famous sites up there. Um, but uh, uh, starting at about 1275, that whole area is depopulated. And then you see um, uh, groups moving into areas all around. They kind of skirt the Phoenix area, but they move to the uh, famous site of Point of Pines, which is a U of A field school for about uh, oh, 10 or 15 years, um, and we think we see them in Safford, and they end up in the San Pedro Valley, we believe, as well. And unlike the, uh, the, the earlier migrants, even though this group is a minority, 
it seems to be a very powerful minority in terms of what, how it changes uh, uh, the local archaeology there in the San Pedro. So um, um, this is our, our, our tested sites. And you notice that we've broken them up into uh, four districts and uh, the Dudleyville, Aravaipa, San Manuel, and Cascabel. And we've done this not um, artificially, but because of uh, patterns in the artifacts that we, we, that we find there. In the Aravaipa district, that's that area where we have a lot of the ball courts, the best land. That's where the Hohokam groups are making their red on buff pottery during the pre-classic period. That's really the, the local folks now, these local Hohokam villages there. Uh, we believe the uh, Cayenta Enclaves are moving into the Cascabel district. So um, uh, particularly at the Davis and Re Ruin there. So um, Cascabel, Cayenta, remember, Aravaipa is, is sort of the home, home team, the, the, the local Hohokam villages. In between, we have the San Manuel district, where we have villages that are probably influenced by both groups, we think. And then finally, we have this Dudleyville district, which we see some of the very latest archaeological settlements in the pre-contact era are concentrated up there. And they look very mixed, both Cayenta and Hohokam. So the Cayenta, even though they're an immigrant minority, seem to have a, a pretty powerful identity. Um, archaeologists, until recently, hated to use migration as an explanation for uh, changes in material culture, uh, at least from the 1960s till about the 1990s at least. So we really had to make our case that we had these immigrant enclaves in the, um, in the Cayenta re in that Cascabel area. And uh, um, some of the indicators uh, that really made our case, first we have uh, at Davis Ranch, there was a, a kiva that was excavated by the Ameren Foundation, and kivas are, are very much a Puebloan type of uh, ceremonial archi uh, architecture. There is a, a foot drum there where you would have had a, a board that you could have jumped up and down and would have made a boom, 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 resonating kind of sound. Um, a ventilator, a bench. These are probably anchors for uh, looms where uh, weaving would have happened. So this is a very classic kiva structure. Uh, also in this Cascabel district, at least at, at Reeve and Davis, we have the, these entry boxes which are only found in the Cayenta region um, before uh, 1275. And um, they're only found um, in the Cascabel district, um, pretty much in the San Pedro after, this, uh, after the Cayenta have left their homeland. So um, these entry boxes, there's a, that's a hearth um, and cross section there. And then a very tall, these slabs would have been very tall and fitting in front of the entry. Um, also, um, perforated plates. Um, this is a, a type of ceramic that um, a form that would have probably been used in pottery production, either as a base mold or as a slow wheel. Uh, Patrick Lyons has done a lot of work on this. Uh, we call him Perforated Patrick because of all <laughs> the uh, work he's done on uh, perforated plates. But um, um, this is sort of. A, a before and after composite, but prior to uh, migration, you have a, a strong concentration of perforated plates up north. After migration, um, they're showing up uh, very concentrated in the San Pedro. And once again, because the San Pedro always works in terms of archaeological patterns, all the, all the perforated plates are where the entry boxes are and the, uh, and the, and the uh, kivas are in, in that Cascabel district. So, all that evidence marshaled together, we have a pretty good case for um, a migration of kind of groups in that, in that Cascavel district area. So once you've proved it, since we're anthropologists, um, um, we want to study it and you know, look at the consequences and, and, and move on from there. And in terms of looking at the consequences of this migration, we kind of break it up into two intervals. This, initial period of migration and then ultimately what happens over the long term. And initially we see a lot of tension and territorialism between local groups and these immigrants. Um, and uh, there's sort of an us versus them mentality. And um, 
there, there's a question about violence. Um, we don't have a lot of direct evidence for violence, and there may not have uh, been much violence. They, they, they might have just been uh, uh, more suspicious of each other than actually having being a, a real threat to each other. So in terms of looking at this evidence, um, when the Cayenta move into the Cascabel district to the south, I remember that we left the uh, local populations kind of dispersed in these um, small villages or small hamlets and farmsteads. When the Cayenta enter, um, they aggregate into about 12 settlements. So uh, they go back to that kind of aggregated uh, settlement pattern that they were in the, with the early ball cart villages. But instead of ball courts, they're building uh, platform mounds uh, and building compounds around their villages or compound walls. Um, so um, these triangles are all the uh, platform mound villages, and there's not a lot of other settlements out there um, um, in the in the San Manuel and, and Aravipa district other than those settlements. So they, they really are circling up the wagons uh, during this interval. And this is just an example. This is actually an aerial of a platform mound in the Tano Basin, but you can just see it's a there's an elevated platform, and then you have a big uh, compound wall around it. Um, so they seem to be marking, uh, marking their territory um, and um, um, building these platform mountain villages about the time the Cayenta arrive. Um, this is just a, a map of one of them, a uh, lost mound um, in the San Pedro in the Aravipa district. And I show it because Sam Rhodes is here, and his house is on the map. <laughs> um, um, but uh, it's also got an interesting story associated with it. That it's a, the, the, uh, there's a compound wall around it, and then you can see that big topographic relief is where the platform mount is. The Lost Mount has been lost twice and found three times. It was originally recorded in 1908 by Jesse Fuchs, then it was lost 50 years, then some Howry students recorded it in 1958, and it was lost again. And then in the 1990s, uh, I think it was Tom Wright was doing a, a, a contract project there and refound it again. And so now that we have it in a map and in our volume, we shouldn't be losing Lost Mount again, hopefully. Um, and um, actually, Sam will make sure we won't lose it again, I hope. <laughs> it's, I don't know how long you've been a neighbor to that site, but uh, or how long your aunt has owned it. But uh, it's kind of, it must be funny that the archaeologists are always losing it and you know exactly where it is. Um, also, we see uh, tensions along the border. This is, this is the boundary between the local settlements and the, uh, and the uh, enclaves. And though the nearest settlements aren't in very fortified, they're kind of in open locations, uh, High Mesa Platform Mound and Reeve Ruin are, are veritable fortresses, both architecturally and in terms of the settings they, they're in. They're, they're, they're basically the two of the most uh, uh, imposing and defensible settlements along the, uh, in the entire valley. And the idea is that maybe when they're getting along, they can trade and interact, but when there's tensions between them, they kind of retreat a little bit and, uh, and, um, and move back to these fortresses. This is High Mesa, and I think, um, um, I don't think Bill, this is an Adriel Heisey shot of High Mesa. And um, it's, um, the only way to get up to it from the floodplain is this arroyo here, and there's actually little guard houses along it. That's the platform mound there. And in the back, there is a, a very restricted access from the back of the terrace. And um, I think that's Bill Doley, how, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, as for a scale. But anyway, right across that, air, that restricted area is, this doesn't look like much of a wall, but it's actually the foundations of, of, a, of a pretty massive adobe wall. So they enhanced the uh, natural defensibility uh, using uh, architecture at this site. In fact, um, um, it was so hard to get to, um, we could walk up and down it, but we had to use a uh, helicopter to bring our equipment in and bring the artifacts out. Um, and uh, one of our volunteers, Georgiana Boyer, uh, had a nephew who had a helicopter tour company, and he volunteered his services so that um, we could test the site. I don't think the site will be tested again soon. Uh, uh, Reeve Ruin is the kind of enclave closest to the uh, 
that boundary, and it's also on a very fortified, it's also on a very steep ridge. It's about a 100 foot drop here. If you fell off of it, you would either die or break your leg or, or whatever, but it's, you wouldn't want to fall off of it. Uh, there's gorgeous trash deposits at the base of this ridge. They just threw their trash off the ridge. Those are cows, those little black dots there, so that's some scale. Um, there's a nice uh, arroyo giving it a, a defense on that side, and you can look up the valley for miles to see who's coming. Um, and um, that's a reconstruction of, uh, of Rebruin uh, in the De Pesos volume of the site. Um, and that ridge line is, is coming up here. So you have a choice of coming into the site this way or this way. If you come in the backside, you have to go through a wall, offset wall, come all the way around into a little guard box, and then come into the site. So once again, the um, um, natural topography has been uh, enhanced by architecture to make a real fortress. So th this really, I think, suggested there's some kind of tension between migrant and local groups, at least during that initial time period. And the us versus them continues on to the decorated pottery as well. Um, the San Carlos red on brown is very much like Hohokam buffware, if you, if you remember looking at that. And that is the local tradition. Um, it's being made, once again, in the Aravipa district, just like the buffware, the pre-classic was. Um, we also start seeing what's called Maverick Mountain polychrome come into the uh, region, um, and that is very much like Kayenta pottery back in the homeland. Uh, essentially, um, they're basically replicating the, the, decor the decorated pottery in their homeland um, and using raw local raw materials to, uh, to make it. And the blue zone is where, the, where they're making Maverick Mountain pottery, so pretty much in the immigrant district. The red zone, um, where they're making San Carlos red on brown. There's some limited trade in this mixed area, but uh, the uh, local groups don't really like uh, the Maverick Mountain, and the uh, um, immigrant groups really don't like the San Carlos red on brown. There seems to be, um, they're displaying, they're showing some identity or, or, or having a little identity war on their, uh, on expressed in pottery perhaps during this, this initial time period. So, um, after this initial period of tension, um, we see those tensions abate um, considerably um, um, in terms of uh, uh, interaction. The Kayenta continue to maintain their identities, we think. They, they kind of form a, a community in exile. Um, they don't assimilate completely into the local uh, uh, um, communities. Um, there's this intense local immigrant interaction, and that really shows up in terms of obsidian trade and pottery trade. And um, eventually, we think these two groups are kind of intermingling and mixing enough that um, they form a, a kind of a new mixed or hybrid culture that archaeologists uh, call the Salado. Um, the Salado has been a, a real enigma in, in trying to explain it in, in archaeology what it is, but think, we think of it as sort of um, a mix between these kind of immigrants and their descendants and these local Hohokam groups, uh, at least in the San Pedro. So, in terms of obsidian, um, um, after uh, AD 1300, so shortly after the Kanta arrived, there's an explosion of obsidian, which is volcanic glass in the, uh, in, 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 the, um, art, in the artifact assemblages in the San Pedro. Um, prior to this period, there's virtually no obsidian. obsidian. There's no local sources of obsidian in the San Pedro. You have to go uh, elsewhere to get it. Um, all they're doing with obsidian is making these arrowheads or these projectile points. And that's all they're doing. So warfare could be an element here in terms of this obsidian trade. But we, we see this enormous bump in obsidian. Um, what's interesting about it is who's controlling this obsidian or a large part of it. Um, the um, map to the left is a map of all obsidian sources known in the southwest. These are those gray shaded areas are all obsidian sources. Each one of them has a unique chemical fingerprint. So whenever we pick up an obsidian artifact somewhere, we send it off to uh, Steve Shackley at Berkeley, and he tells us which one of these gray areas it comes from. So it's a great way to reconstruct trade patterns. Um, 
for the San Pedro, almost all of our uh, obsidian is coming from uh, this Mule Creek area um, in um, just across the Mexico border. A little bit's coming from Cow Canyon as well. Um, and um, almost all of this obsidian is going into the, uh, to the immigrants. Um, the, uh, um, which is an interesting pattern because um, you'd expect them being a minority maybe not to be so plugged into this trade. But uh, yeah, like 60, 70% of the obsidian in the, uh, in the San Pedro is Mule Creek obsidian. All of the obsidian um, that we find in the Cayenta Enclave region is Mule Creek. Um, as you go north, you see more buried sources, um, um, still Mule Creek dominant, but some other sources are picking up as you go north into the Arabipa district. But our, our explanation of this pattern is that the Cayenta groups are somehow controlling at least this Mule Creek obsidian trade. It's, it's coming in from Mule Creek to the uh, Cayenta area, and then the Cayenta groups are passing it along to local groups. And uh, this pattern is one of the reasons that we're currently working in the Mule Creek area right now, because we think we've identified a Cayenta enclave there, and we, what we have is we're starting to pick up networks of Cayenta enclaves that are continuing to maintain communications with each other in the various valleys that they're in um, as sort of a, a community in exile. And, and one of the things that's circulating within this community is, is Mule Creek uh, obsidian. Um, more importantly, this is that slide that showed the us versus them in terms of pottery traditions. Um, uh, this replaces both of those traditions, uh, Salado Polychrome. And um, um, early, early on, the, the Salado Polychrome type, uh, Gila Polychrome, is, is dominant. Um, what's interesting about Gila Polychrome, um, where it's being produced is the same area that Maverick Mountain uh, was being produced. It's being produced by immigrant enclaves. So at this point, we're going to be talking about the descendants of immigrants. Um, um, so they are producing all of this pottery, um, and it's traded all the way up to the Aravipa district. So everybody in the entire San Pedro is using this pottery. Uh, the one area that's not producing any more decorated pottery, including Salado Polychrome, is that local um, uh, group uh, at the Aravipa district, which is a, there's a red X there. So it's interesting that the uh, immigrants have kind of taken over the, the decorated pottery tradition. It's a different decorated pottery than what they, they came in with, um, uh, but, it is, but they are in control of its production. And um, we're playing with, around with reasons why this, uh, is this pattern, why this immigrant minority is um, in control and uh, looking at some of the symbols and iconography on, on this Salata polychrome. And uh, one thing that's dominant are, is either birds, a serpent uh, or bird or bird serpent imagery. And uh, there could be a Mesoamerican connection here, especially with uh, the, the Quetzalcoatl, who's a feathered serpent uh, uh, deity in, uh, in Mesoamerica, a very powerful one. And uh, up, up at Zuni, at Zuni Pueblo, the feathered serpent, uh, Coloisi, is a very powerful uh, figure for fertility and rain bringing. And um, Hopi also has a, 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 has a similar kind of figure. But these are, uh, pottery specialists tell me at least, that these are probably plumed serpents. Um, you could probably make several different types of animals out of them, but that's what they interpret them as. And, and these as well, and this is a pot that this is filled with those that kind of imagery. But over 40% of the pots have this, some uh, Salado polychrome pots have some sort of serpent or serpent bird imagery. Um, so whether the Cayenta, through their pueblo connections, are picking up some of that Mesoamerican mojo or magic, and then you know kind of passing it on to local groups, is 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 one explanation why they might be controlling this this this. Uh, um, polychrome trade. And it's not just an economic good, but it's definitely got uh, a religious and ideological value and it might symbolize a, a new religion that's emerging. And um, since the locals are buying into it, it looks like this us versus them is being replaced by a we uh, in terms of 
the interactions there. There's there's some sort of integrative function that's that's going on, or some uh, in terms of um, getting past that point of initial tensions and ultimately um, leading, heading towards integration. Uh, this is a late version of that uh, slot of polychrome that Patrick identified, uh, or re-identified, or rediscovered in his analysis of our um, uh, of our assemblage, cliff polychrome. But you can see serpents and wings again. Uh, but you've got exterior designs, a lot, a lot of bold designs here. Uh, what's interesting about this is that the production area down here uh, remains. We also start picking up later in time uh, a production area to the north in these settlements that we think are very late and very mixed between immigrants and local groups. So this hybrid, this hybrid culture is kind of appearing up north. Um, and um, um, I should point out that during this time period, you see that there's a lot fewer sites in the San Pedro now. Sites are failing and dropping out. And we're so, this is a, a kind of a, a question that we've been very interested in um, and still trying to work on why sites are failing. But uh, the San Manuel district in the middle uh, kind of empties out. Um, eventually, this area goes. And by the early 1400s, everybody's pretty much living between the uh, Air Viper Creek and the, um, and the Gila River. So a real contraction and reduction of population. Um, right at the height of this slot of polychrome religion. And, and at, at this point in time, 25% of the decorated, 25% uh, of ceramic assemblages are slot of polychrome. And that's a huge percentage of decorated in any kind of assemblage, because generally you just get a bunch of plain wares and maybe, you know, two or 3% decorated. So huge production of Salata polychrome. And, it, and once again, this coincides with this reduction of settlement. And then after 1450, even these settlements are gone. We can't find anybody home after 1450 in the San Pedro um, for a long time. And that's, that's a, an interesting question. When, we, when the curtain reopens, we're at the uh, time of Father Kino, who did a very good map of, of the San Pedro. And um, we know from excavated structures um, from this time period that have U European artifacts, this is the, the kind of ar archaeology that we're looking at. Um, these are very uh, ephemeral structures. They're little rock rings where they would have built, uh, had bent poles across them, so completely different than the massive classic period architecture. No decorated ceramics, no obsidian. Uh, it's hard to find, that, that may be one of the few whole pots from this time period uh, out there. Um, very little pottery. It looks like a very mobile group is, is, is there in the San Pedro when Father Kino arrives. And between 1450 and 1650, we don't have any sites uh, or uh, that I know of in, in the San Pedro. And this is a pattern that's repeated across much of the southern southwest. Uh, the, they call this these two centuries the missing centuries, and trying to bridge that gap between the um, what's going on at the end of the classic period with the Salado and what's going on here with the Sabipri, that's what the Spanish called the uh, indigenous inhabitants of the San Pedro, is a real big research question. Because from the Sabipri, we can then trace uh, groups to the Adam people today pretty, um, pretty strongly. So I'll end there long enough. Um, and um, I just want to say that in terms of the San Pedro being our crown jewel, um, it's area number five on this slide. And um, um, the rest of those areas are represent two NSF grants, which continue our research and keep me and other people employed, which is important. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the San Pedro with its, you know, it's, it's, it's really is a wonderful place because, once again, it's an analytical unit that's whole. All those sites are preserved. Um, we tested all the sites using the same methods, and the patterns just, you know, always are, are clean in the San Pedro. And we started applying, looking at, at other regions, the Safford Basin, area number four, uh, the Tano Basin two, the, the, uh, the area number three is the Phoenix area, uh, area number one is Perry Mesa, the Agua Fria National, National Monument. That was one NSF grant that we got in 2003. In 2008, we got another NSF grant to go over into Southwest New Mexico in the Mule Creek area. 
and the Mimbris area to study what the Salado looked like on the Mogollon side of the uh, dividing line. Because once we cross into New Mexico, we're in the Mimbris area and the Mogollon area and outside the Hohokam area. But we still have uh, Cayenta uh, immigrants moving into that area um, at 1300 AD. And that's this, these Cayenta migration zones are kind of the result of this. Um, we now uh, have um, kind of mapped out where they initially landed when they moved from northeastern Arizona. They're minorities in all these areas, so they, they're not a majority anywhere, but they seem to, wherever they, wherever they go, they seem to have a lot of influence and they stay connected with each other. Um, so that's two NSF grants that we've gotten our National Science Foundation grants, and uh, we just got a third one that we'll be starting um, next uh, in January. We're, we're looking at the groups that said no to Salado, essentially. This, this area here um, to the right that says Salado, uh, to the left that says Salado Edge, is sort of the maximum extent where we have really dense Salado polychrome uh, distribution. So this is the extent of that religion um, that goes along with Salado polychromes. That's um, basically in, initiated by immigrant groups, but the local groups are buying into. But as you head south into the Papagaria or along the San Pedro or into um, um, uh, the Chiricahuas, we think we've reached the limits of that religion. And what are local groups doing? Are they actively resisting? Are they more traditional? What's, what's going on there? And that's the topic of uh, uh, this upcoming research grant. So wherever we go, though, the San Pedro and those patterns are always in the back of our mind in, in terms of, um, of, of guiding us. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Bill, who will talk about preservation. Quick change here. One thing that Jeff has said a couple of times that the San Pedro, um, the way I like to say it is that the San Pedro is a place that actually wants to tell its story. It really does do a great job of that. <coughs> and it takes uh, a bunch of sharp people to pull that information together. And I want to make sure that we adequately acknowledge one of those sharp people, and that's Patrick Lyons off here to my right. Um, <laughs> you'll notice that Jeff and Patrick are the co-authors on the volume that we've uh, finally completed here and is available. So uh, thank you, Patrick, for all you put into this. And there's more coming. There's work on the Davis Ranch Ruin, which is one of those uh, migrant places where that Kiva was <coughs> located. So just to wrap things up, uh, we talk about preservation archaeology as what we do at Archaeology Southwest. And the way our work on the San Pedro has <coughs> developed over time, that it has been the incubator and the place that we've uh, experimented and, and sort of found our way through uh, developing that concept of, of preservation archaeology. So the San Pedro, in terms of just the, the land ownership, that's what this is showing, largely state trust land in the area that we've been working in. Um, and so that was actually one of the reasons that we went out there originally to do the work that we did. Uh, the state, state land department doesn't have uh, even a, a mandate, uh, let alone any resources to do much in the way of, of, of active management of, of the <coughs> archeological record on the land that they own, own and manage. So we felt very much that this survey that we did out there would contribute to long-term management of that resource. And what is all around the valley is growing populations. The Tucson area, obviously the biggest population unit in the region. Uh, and you notice there's hardly any place except for Sierra Vista and maybe to a little bit uh, of an extent uh, Benson, um, in the valley itself, it has much of a, a population. So uh, it's almost the kind of place where people 
look and say, we could go there and do things because nobody lives there and nobody cares. Um, <coughs> and there's lots of folks uh, kind of circling around the valley that uh, might think that way. So the unfortunate thing that where we really got tuned into the need for active preservation was a situation of loss. Um, Jeff has covered the, the um, major villages, the platform mound villages there that between uh, Reddington and uh, the Aravaipa area. And <clears throat> what doesn't show up as strongly uh, until we put the empty circle on there, there's a little place called Big Bell on there that you'll see doesn't have a map. And <clears throat> back in the 40s, uh, a avocational archeologist um, discovered out there a large copper bell, and that's where the name Big Bell came from. And the, as we did our survey, we actually visited that site early on and did a brief recording, but we didn't get a chance to get back and map, create a detailed map. And about six to eight months after uh, the event happened, the 1993 uh, floods that hit Tucson and the, uh, certainly affected the San Pedro resulted in the, it was then magma copper, uh, BHP is now owns that, um, going out with heavy equipment to protect their infrastructure, their, their uh, water lines and, and their uh, wells along the, the San Pedro, they literally pushed that site of Big Bell into the river, over the edge there. So we lost that site in basically a 24 hour period. And intriguingly, that was the second 100 year flood in 10 years, but. Um, <coughs> So, but what really kind of struck us as we finally got the information as to what had happened is that it took us six or eight months to find out about that. We were doing our survey based here in Tucson, going out on the weekends, coming back. We were not connected to that valley. And so we realized that preservation isn't gonna happen by itself. All these places were in pretty good condition, as Jeff has, has <coughs> indicated, but they don't just stay that way that by themselves. So we started to implement active programs, <coughs> the natural resource conservation districts out there. Those are really the, lo the local land use communities. We started going and <coughs> visiting them in their, in their uh, either quarterly or monthly meetings and telling them about what we're doing. And we <coughs> continued on uh, as we did, I mean, Jeff has pointed out that when we <coughs> did our uh, excavations out there, we involved local folks. We did presentations about what we were doing. We tried to share that, <coughs> that information and get it back uh, to the local community and not just be the outsiders. <coughs> our uh, study of the sands of the entire uh, watershed so that we can source ceramics. Uh, all of these things were, we, we got much more active in trying to uh, document what was out on that landscape. So <coughs> in 2005, when the Department of Transportation decided that uh, wouldn't it be a grand idea if there was a way for trucks to get, <coughs> uh, find a rapid way around Tucson, the urban congestion and that sort of thing, and again, that empty landscape of the San Pedro looked like a wonderful place to channel that, um, that, those trucks. So it basically would be a new freeway going along the San Pedro Valley. And there were both a lot of the folks who live in the valley and ourselves who have been working there and other groups that have been working in the valley that thought that really isn't a particularly good idea. And <laughs> so um, one of the leaders, uh, uh, this little community of Cascabel that Jeff has talked about, the Cascabel District, um, it's also a place where there's a real diversity of, of uh, modern folks out on that landscape. 
And if you don't see the community center, um, or even the community, uh, there's the center right there. And this is a very dispersed community on that landscape out there. It runs for literally multiple miles along the river. But they do have a place to come together and, and talk and have meetings and so on. So <coughs> the, we have, over the course of time, spent a, a fair amount of time at meetings out there. Uh, this is. Uh, that was another project that um, I had meant to mention. Uh, T.J. Ferguson, from now from the University of Arizona, uh, Roger Anion, now from Pima County, and Chip Colwell Chantapon, uh, who was a preservation fellow with us, uh, had a National Endowment for the Humanities grant that allowed uh, them to bring Hopi, Zuni, uh, Western Apache, and Tana Autumn folks out to that valley to experience, I mean, it, there is only a little bit of, of uh, Indian reservation up in the Aravaipa area in that entire valley. So that brought folks back to places that they may have had <coughs> uh, oral history uh, connections to, but they hadn't seen these places in a long time, if ever. So reconnecting people with their heritage. And <coughs> the, uh, this is one of those uh, subipery structures, a group of Tana Autumn out there. Uh, just above the community center there is the Taylor site, and uh, that's where they're, they're visiting. <coughs> and getting together, sharing a lunchtime meal with uh, folks there at the community center. So there was a big um, response from local community, uh, the archaeological community, Archaeology Southwest, and other environmental uh, interests to push back against that. That was ultimately, um, again, fortunately, that's another road plan that ADOT has shelved. And <coughs> so in 2007, we awarded the Cascabel community our Sense of Place Award for their efforts in uh, fighting back, because really, in those kinds of events, a local community has a strong, probably the strongest voice of all. So us outsiders have uh, something to say, but we're not the necessarily the primary voice that gets listened to. So those uh, folks had a big uh, part in that. Today, <laughs> um, the <coughs> I mean, I think we're all well aware that the um, alternative energy is going to have a big impact on the Southwest. We've got a lot of sun, and we've got a lot of wind, and uh, there needs to be power lines to carry those, um, that power that's generated from alternative sources. And right now, there's a uh, project called Sunzia, which actually originates up in North c Central or Northeastern New Mexico and, and connects to Tucson and then, or excuse me, to Phoenix and then onward. Um, and our position on these kinds of things is not so much, you know, we must stop this kind of thing. It's we need to use planning information, and that's what we've been out there doing on the ground for all this time, and to use this kind of information to actually design things that have <coughs> reduced impacts on the archaeological rec record out there on the, on the land. So. That is really what we're, we've become uh, consulting partners in, or um, <coughs> pl uh, whatever, con consulting parties um, in the environmental review process and are consistently trying to respond to the environmental review process as it goes forward. Sometimes without a lot of results, but we'll keep, keep going. Um, so this is really what this kind of information that it has great research value, but it also has uh, value for protecting archaeological resources. And there's progress on the efforts that we've been making as an or organization to <coughs> protect sites on that landscape. This is back to our survey inventory on the right there. And we now own um, two <coughs> chunks of land out there, 95 acres on the west side, a little north of Reddington, and it has one of these sites that's kind of in the, one of those boundary zones that Jeff was referring to. 
kind of a special purpose site. And then the eight acres there on the right side is in reference to the ball court there at Reddington. And we have conservation easements on, we just were donated an easement uh, fairly recently uh, on one of the sites that the Ameren Foundation tested in the past. And the 50 acres actually has three archeological sites on it that are now protected by easement. So we've slowly been working with uh, the local groups out there and uh, just by being present on that landscape and keeping talking to folks, we have opportunities to uh, ad advance that protection effort. And there's lots of partners out there as well. Um, <coughs> the Bureau of Land Management, this is uh, the, where Hot, uh, Hot Springs Wash joins the San Pedro, uh, the Taylor site that again has a proto-historic occupation. Uh, Jim Vint has actually done some excavation out there. It also has a multi-component site. There's, there's early, <coughs> sorry about that. There's early agricultural occupation, um, various uh, pre-classic and uh, some also some of that dispersed classic period occupation out there. So uh, a very important place uh, preserved uh, with an easement by the BLM working with private landowners. We've played an active part in, in making that happen. The uh, Nature Conservancy has preserves out there. A lot of those preserves have important sites on them. Uh, they're now managing two key places that two key platform in the in the mammoth area. In the near uh, side here, the site called Leverton and in the background Camp Village. So those two places are uh, likely to be uh, protected and, and have a manager at, at present that's uh, actively engaged in monitoring them. And <coughs> Pima County has, uh, is now the owner of the Reeve Ruin, uh, absolutely critical place for uh, the work that the Ameren Foundation did in terms of under the initial kind of view into this migrant uh, movement into the area. So uh, another piece of the landscape out there. So there's still site stewards. Um, we had for almost, for about a decade out there, Jackie Dale was out there uh, living in the Cascavel community and she's found Hawaii a better place than the <laughs> San Pedro, but that's her problem. Um, and <laughs> but uh, there is still an active site program, uh, steward program out there uh, monitoring sites on the San Pedro. So uh, this is a view down on the, you know, get a feel from a helicopter of what the uh, top of the Reeve Ruin and those steep cliffs that Jeff talked about. I think you would die, Jeff, so I don't <laughs> think that. <laughs> so anyway, um, so preservation archaeology, uh, the San Pedro has engaged us uh, in many ways over the course of our involvement out there. And, you know, the simple sort of triad of, of uh, you know, we're doing active research. So I think Jeff has conveyed that uh, pretty well uh, today. Uh, if you didn't pick up a copy of the Archaeology Southwest magazine, that's the, that's the way we try to share our information as broadly as possible. And uh, our scientific publications as well, probably a much narrower audience. And uh, we now have this active site protection program uh, with Andy Lorenzi, a full-time uh, employee with us. But I really view this, this is one of my favorite views of that uh, landscape out there, the having a largely intact uh, physical landscape, having the knowledge of what is out there in terms of the resources, uh, having a local community that really supports and understands uh, the values of these places is critical. And the fact that the Native American communities are also aware of the deep history that they have and connections out there. So this is um, the kind of model of what preservation archaeology, I think, can do in its uh, broadest form. And so I'll leave you with this uh, image. And Jeff and I are happy to take uh, com comments, questions, um, assaults by professionals that might. <laughs> <laughs>
So come on back up, Jack. I, Jeff, I'm going to use you as a shield on some of these things if, if necessary. <laughs> And I just want to underscore that, I mean, I, I hope you as our members and supporters um, see that this, both, all of this, these elements of, of preservation archaeology are really important things. The San Pedro in particular has been the home of nonprofit archaeology. Adolf Bandelier was hired by the Archaeological Institute of America back in 1881, uh, and he went out as one of the earliest um, professionals out on the, the San Pedro. Uh, the Ameren Foundation, uh, again, uh, was the primary player out there until we got out there and then our efforts. Again, the nonprofit world is out there uh, in these kinds of places that don't have, uh, most archeology span now is getting done through uh, prior to uh, development projects. So the nonprofit world really has, has stepped up uh, and tried to tell the story of this place and is working hard to, to advocate for the long-term protection as well. So, end of speech.